Hi, everybody. Happy New Year. Thank you for clicking over to my talk. I'm really excited to tell you all a little bit about some of the work we've been doing on how tardigrades get around. So these guys are colloquially known as water bears. I'm showing one here on my title slide. Uh, and this is going to be joint work with Lisette Duran Rosario, who is a graduate student in Daniel Cohen's lab at Princeton, as well as with Deborah Johnston, who was a high school project student in the Cohen lab last summer. So even if tardigrades aren't your research system of choice, you probably heard a little bit about them, in particular with respect to the ability of their to survive in a huge host of different environmental extremes. So within Tardigrada, there are species indeed that can survive extremes in temperature, in radiation, really almost anything. Um, they were even recently in the news for crash landing on the moon. And the reason that they have these remarkable survival skills is because of their ability to enter a dormant state when environmental conditions has become too tough. And this state is called a ton. And while some tardigrades have been in the ton state for only a short period of time, others have been known to be able to be brought back to life after over a century of hiding out as a ton. Um, and the molecular details of how this transition occurs is really an active area of research. And the adaptations that different tardigrade species have to survive in such a wide range of extremes is, is remarkable and super fascinating. But I think that the non-extreme day-to-day -day bits of tardigrade life cycles are also really fascinating and have a lot to teach us. So for example, tardigrades are among the smallest walking legged animals, as well as one of the only extant group that is a soft bodied walker. And being a soft walker means that you can use a completely different biomechanical strategy to get around than animals with rigid uh, exoskeletons like insects or rigid endoskeletons like vertebrates like us. And even though that there, there are a lot of soft bodied animals out there, we don't know that much about how they control their locomotion. And that's not for lack of trying. Some of the most important insights that we've gotten into the control of locomotion come from getting data on individual leg kinematics. So I'm showing here, for example, a setup on the fruit fly Drosophila. And from a setup like this, we can get out various kinematic parameters like step length or stride period, as well as measure relative coordination in, in, between, the two, in between the multiple legs. And this is possible because we have these discrete contact points. We have the tips of the legs that we can track and see. But in soft body crawlers like earthworms or, or nematodes, it's really hard to get out similar measurements because there's not these neat discrete contact points that you can use to quantify some stepping or coordination pattern. And I know this because once upon a time, I tried to get out similar data on snakes, um, showing here a corn snake on photoelastic gelatin. And here we were trying to get our qualitative data on their, their ground reaction forces. And even this was exceedingly difficult. So I can imagine how much more difficult it would have been if we'd been trying to actually quantify this. And this is why I think tardigrades are such a compelling system biomechanically. So using a similar setup to the one I showed for Drosophila, we can film tardigrades with a high-speed camera walking along an agarose gel. Uh, and these videos are on gel of stiffness, about 50 kilopascals. And similar to the flies, we can get out the data that we need to get out the kinematic factors for their walking coordination. Um, so the data that I'm going to be showing in this talk come from experiments on the limno-terrestrial tardigrade Hypsipias dujardini. Uh, so once we have a setup like this up and running, we can get out the information that we need to ask some questions. And we started by asking the simplest one. Do tardigrades walk in a coordinated, regular way? And I mentioned at the start of the talk that there's a lot of recent work that's been done on tardigrades. So you might be asking, well, OK, if there's all this work on it, why don't we know this? Uh, the fact is that the vast majority of that work has focused on their ton formation and their extreme survival strategies. And so when we first started thinking about their locomotion and their locomotor performance and we started reading about it, we realized that there wasn't that much out there. And so we were kind of in the Wild West, which was really exciting, but also meant that we had to start with the basics and develop a framework. And this really wasn't such a trivial question. Phylogenetically, tardigrades go a long way back. And despite the fact that they live in a wide range of terrain, so I mentioned that the species that we worked with was limino terrestrial, but there are both marine and freshwater species as well. Despite this diversity, their body plants are conserved, particularly when it comes to their locomotor apparatus. And so they've maintained a lot of the features from their primitive ancestors. For 
also pretty famously clumsy at getting around. Uh, they got their name from this. And, and to add to that, uh, the only other panarthropod clade that walks using soft legs called lobopods are the velvet worms uh, shown. I'm showing one of these little guys here. And studies on their gait have shown that their interleg coordination is not nearly as regular as that in arthropod species with rigid skeletons. So this begs the question of whether controlling lobopodal locomotion is inherently more difficult because of the additional degrees of freedom required. But after a few initial observations on tardigrades, it became clear that they didn't have any problem maintaining a pretty stable stepping pattern. So in particular, they displayed a preference for tetrapodal gates, where diagonal legs swing or lift off together in sets of two, leaving four legs on the ground, um, hence tetrapodal. And this was a common pattern we knew from slow walking arthropods like stick insects. And so this was really exciting for us to see the, this relationship because now immediately we had a framework within which we could work. All right, so once we got that initial question out of the way, we were ready to dig a little bit deeper. And we knew that most animals change the way they move with speed. So horses, for instance, go from walking to trotting to galloping as they go faster and faster. And we wanted to see similarly what tardigrades did as they increased their walking speed. So we looked at relative timings of steps between legs and how these patterns might change as tardigrades change their walking speed. So for instance, if an insect is walking very fast, they tend to use a tripod coordination where three legs step all together. If they're going really slow, they can use what's called a wave gait, where only one leg at a time comes off the ground. And in the middle, when they're going at intermediate speeds, they can use what's tetrapodal gaits, which is the kind of gaits that we observed in our initial characterization in tardigrades. So what we did was measure the relative timing between contralateral leg pairs, so that's leg pairs that are directly across from each other, as well as ipsilateral leg pairs, so leg pairs that are directly anterior and posterior neighbors. And we found that tardigrades maintain their preferred coordination across all walking speeds that we measured. And this preference with an ipsilateral phase offset about one third and a contralateral offset of about one half, so anti-phase contralateral offset, corresponded to observations of tetrapodal gates in Drosophila and was really nice to kind of quantifiably help confirm our preliminary observations. So it turns out that it also means that we reject this hypothesis. Tardigrades like to stick to a single interleg coordination strategy across spontaneous walking speeds. But what about with environmental changes? So because they're soft bodied, we knew that tardigrades crawl by gripping onto the substrate and pulling themselves forward like we would with grappling hooks while we're climbing. So we decided to see if and how they would respond to changes in substrate stiffness. Uh, for instance, if we use a softer gel to give them more give and cause them to slip back with each pull forward. And so say this is akin to us kind of stepping onto a patch of ice. And if we did, we would soon sense that we were slipping and perhaps choose a different posture or a different walking strategy than if we were on grass or concrete. And we found that tardigrades do this as well. So their ipsilateral coordination largely stayed the same between substrates. So they still prefer to phase offset of one third between ipsilateral leg pairs, but their contralateral legs stepped in phase instead of anti-phase. So they kind of developed this bounding or galloping gait that I'm showing here. So we were able to confirm our final hypothesis. Tardigrades do indeed seem to sense changes in substrate properties and adjust their strategies to deal with those changes in real time. But the exciting thing I think about this work, for me at least, the most exciting thing has been that with every question that got answered by our experiments, a few more got asked. And this is largely because, like I mentioned, there was so, so little known about the mechanism and evolution of tardigrade locomotion that we were just in this phase of really finding a lot of stuff out very quickly. Um, and so I'm going to focus uh, for the next couple of minutes on two questions here that we're currently thinking about. First. We noted that when we switched the tardigrades onto the softer substrate, they still did sometimes use their favorite tetrapodal coordination in addition to the galloping gait that I showed. And they often, importantly, they switched kind of back and forth between even mid-cycle. And this indicated to us that tardigrade gates were way more flexible, way more variable than those we observe in vertebrates. And so perhaps they could all be controlled by a single underlying neural pathway rather than requiring separate controllers for each coordination pattern. 
And part of what led us to this hypothesis is recent studies in insects, particularly in Drosophila, that showed that walking patterns across speeds were constrained to a single manifold. And on this manifold, all the gait patterns, including the ones, the tetrapodal ones that we observed in tardigrades, mapped really nicely onto. And the authors of this paper proposed a simple single circuit that consists of mutual inhibition between contralateral leg pairs and a back to front inhibitory circuit on each ipsilateral side. And a natural place anatomically for a circuit like this to exist in insects would be in the VNC or ventral nerve cord. So this consists of three segmented ganglia, which I'm showing two here, and one for each pair of legs. So each of these ganglia is then split into left and right hemiganglia. So essentially on this picture on the left here, each of these circles would correspond to a hemiganglion on the insect VNC. And so then that got us to thinking about where a similar circuit might exist underlying tardigrade, tardigrade walking and, and importantly, how universal this underlying locomotor control strategy might be across pan arthropods. And we were encouraged initially by looking at comparative structures between arthropods and tardigrade VNCs, which particularly showed some really nice similarities that fit very well into such a simple model. For instance, the segmented ipsilateral ganglia, as well as the division into left and right hemiganglia. And this hypothesis was very interesting to me in particular because I thought it led to some very interesting side questions. So if such a locomotor control strategy is used by both tardigrades and insects, does that indicate a shared ancestral circuit or perhaps convergence onto similar circuits? And the great thing about a question like this is that both options are equally exciting, whether or not we, we reject this or accept this hypothesis. Because in one sense, if there is an ancestral circuit, then that gives us a lot of insight into the evolution of the diversity of arthropod uh, locomotion strategies and control of locomotion. And on the other hand, if both tardigrades and insects have kind of converged independently onto this locomotor control strategy, that gives us a lot of insight into fundamental design principles for efficiently controlling multi-legged locomotion using simple circuits that can fit into small animals. And importantly, a strategy that scales across sizes and vastly different skeletal structures. OK. So I'll stop there now and I just want to thank some of the places that have supported me and this work and my collaborators who I've been super, super lucky to work with, including, of course, our favorite collaborator, the, the tardigrade. Um, and so thank you for, for joining me and I'm looking forward to your questions in the chat.